Nothing else matters but what you're doing. The only thing that matters is spreading the gospel, talking to people about Jesus, helping other people. And when you get in the pulpit, boy, it just makes it so much easier to preach. You just filled up inside of you. I want to answer the question that a lot of y'all are going to ask me here in a little bit. Just go ahead and get this out of the way. Every time you saw me working in that video, yes, I was posing. I really wasn't working in those videos. They said, preacher, we've got to have something to put in here. And so that's how I ended up getting in some of the videos. But we had a great time. And you know, preachers only work two days a week. This is my one work day. And Wednesday, I'll work my second day. But uh, we had a great time. It's good to be back. If you're a first-time guest, if this is your first time here, I'd like to welcome you. I'm Matt Burrell. I'm the lead pastor here. It's an honor to get to preach to you today. And I'm so thankful that you came to worship with us this morning. We've been preaching a sermon series on the supernatural church and talking about what it looks like for a church to be supernatural. And you say, what do you mean by that, supernatural? I, well, I, I'm not talking about some kind of miracle coming down today. I'm talking about a church that is supernaturally used by God. And you say, how do you know if a church is supernatural? Well, you see people getting saved. You see folks being baptized. You see lives being changed. You see God working in people. That's what a supernatural church is all about. And that's our desire to be supernatural right here at Liberty Baptist Church. Here in a few minutes, we're going to take our text from Romans chapter number 8. Paul was writing that letter to the church there in Rome. But Paul admits something in chapter number 7 that I want all of us to recognize this morning. Paul said this in Romans 7. He said, in my body, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. When I would do good, evil is present with me. You know what he's saying? I want to serve God, but I fail. How many of you, you ever felt that way in your life? Hey, I want to do good, but I fail. I've done it a thousand times, man. I've woke up before and done things or thought things and think to myself, what in the world's wrong with you, Matt Burrell? You're a Christian. You ought to be serving God. What's going on with you? I, sometimes I feel like God looks down from heaven and says, Good gracious, Matt, I've been patient with you a thousand times. Every time you get up, you fall back down. What's wrong with you? Why don't you serve me? You ever feel that way? Well, Paul said very clearly, there's a struggle in the Christian life. If you're here this morning and you've ever heard somebody tell you, hey, listen, I've got everything figured out. I, I don't have problems with sin. I live for the Lord. It's easy for me. I just go along and do all the things that God wants me to do. I want you to know that that person lied to you. I want you to know that because he is lying. This Christian life is a struggle. It is a constant struggle to live for God. It is a constant falling down and getting up. It's a constant trying to live and failing. And today, Paul answers the, the, the question, well, Paul, if in you is bad things, how is it that you're able to serve God? Now, many of us would say Paul did a pretty good job, didn't he? I mean, he like wrote 13 books of the Bible, started like 1,500 churches, traveled all over the world preaching the gospel. He did a pretty good job. But Paul admitted he had problems. But how was it he was able to accomplish that? How was it that he was able to move past this falling and getting up? How did he do that? Well, we want to look at that. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, Paul, and he, he addresses how it is that we can overcome the struggle that is serving God. We've all got those struggles in our life. So if you will, let's read verses 1 through verse 17, and we're going to look at what Paul says about being a Spirit-led church. You see, when the Spirit is what's leading and the flesh is what's left out, the church can't help but be supernatural. When the Spirit is what we rely on and the flesh is what we deny, we'll find that the struggle will become easier. Now notice what Paul says in these 17 verses. Let's read these together this morning. The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded 
is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we ask you, Lord, this morning, help us with our struggle. God, help us, Lord, to rise above the flesh. Help us to be led by your Spirit. God, help your Spirit to be the thing that guides us through our life. Help us, God, not to rely on other things, but to be led by your Spirit, to be a Spirit-led church that we might enter into the supernatural ability to serve you. Lord, we love you. Lord, help me as I preach, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I'm going to show you several things about how we should live our life, but I want to start my sermon this morning by how we should not live our life. On the board, I've got three things that we should not live our life by. When you look at these three things and we think about these three things, these three things are very common to the church. Many people say, preacher, I struggle to serve God, and the reason they struggle to serve God is because they're trying to live their life by one of these three things. And if you take notes, write these down. The first one is the rule book. You know, a lot of people feel like the Christian life is a book of rules. It's this, this rule book that you've got to adhere to. And it's like we're walking around with this list of things that we can do. We're, we're walking around with this list of things that we can't do. These are things i got to do. These are things I can never do. And then if you can't understand the rule book clearly, you come to the pastor and you say, Pastor, can I watch this television show? Is it in the rule book? And I want you to know that you can't live your life by rules. You know what the problem with the rule book always is? Is if I like it, then it's in the rule book. But if I don't like it, guess what? It don't make it in the rule book. And if you're the one writing the rule book, you like the things you like, you write those down. The things I don't, I say, no, no, I disagree with that. We're going to keep those. I like this, I don't like that. And here's the problem. It turns into legalism because legalism says, I can do things to please God. But I want you to know this morning, there's nothing you can do to please God in your life. You can't do it. So if you're trying to keep the rule book, how long the skirt's got to be, the pant leg, the foot, the, what kind of your hairstyle, the rule book's going to fail you every time. It's going to fail you every time. Number two, living by a formula. Does anybody know what that is? That's when you go down to the Christian bookstore and you find the book, Six Steps to Having Your par Prayers Answered. You know, Three ways to find the deep fullness of God in your life. Uh, three ways to read your Bible with perfect understanding. Four factors that'll fix this. Now, I'm not saying that all those principles are bad, but here's what I want you to understand. The Christian life is not two parts prayer, one part uh, Bible study, two parts church attendance, and three parts of this. It's not a formula. There's no magic spell that you, if you say it enough or you do it in the right order, that all of a sudden something's going to happen. You know, this idea that prayer doesn't work if we don't do it a certain way, the reason most of our prayers don't work is we don't pray it doesn't have anything to do with how or when or what order it's got to do with we don't pray you have not Jesus said why you asked not it wasn't how you asked it was the fact that you didn't ask is why you didn't have it the formula books don't work either and this third one is one we have to be super careful with most people are trying to live their life by experiences 
So preacher, what is an experience? An experience is where you go to that revival meeting. Man, the preacher preaches. You start feeling guilty. You crawl down on the altar. People gather around. They pray over you. You make confessions. You make promises. You do all these things. And then you get up and you go out like, whoo, boy. And then on Tuesday, you're right back in the same place you found yourself before you went to the altar. You go down to the concert where the, the, the worship team is worshiping, and man, you're in it, and you're loving it, and you're enjoying it. Man, you can just feel something, but then on Wednesday of the next week, that feeling's wore off, and here you're back at the job trying to make decisions again that are the same decisions you were making before, and that experience is wore off. The problem with the experience is you got to keep coming back and getting more experience. you got to come back the next week and have a, another experience, and you got to do it again and again and again, and the problem is experience is wear off. I say it like this, and it's the real truth. Experiences are like whipped cream. Man, they really taste good, but you can't live on it. It don't last long. It burns off. It burns off. It goes away. And the experience is gone. And you say, man, but it was good in the moment. And it was good in the moment. But it doesn't last in your life. And you can't serve God based on one experience that happened to you and think, well, this is the thing that's going to change me. It's not going to do it. I'm going to go to one more crusade, one more revival meeting, one more preaching thing. I'm going to go to that one thing. And then in that moment, it's going to change me. That's not how it works. That's not what it does. You say, well, preacher, how does it work? Well, I'm glad you asked. Y'all okay? Everybody okay? If you're glad to be in church, say amen. amen. All right, I just want to make sure you're breathing. That's all that was. Some of you, I thought it died. I want to make sure you're all right. I want you to see real quickly, though, three things that Paul says are gifts to every believer. Many people come to me and say, Preacher, I don't have this gift in my life. Or, Preacher, I don't know what my gifts are. And there may be things in your life that are yet to be discovered in your spiritual life. But understand this today. Paul's fixing to cover three gifts that we know Every believer who's saved by the grace of God, you have all three of these gifts in your life. And if we'll use these gifts in our life, we will see a change in our life. And the struggle, although it'll always be there, it'll be an easier struggle and we'll serve God in a more effective way. Notice, first of all, verses 5 through 8. We look at it with me. If y'all listen fast, I'll preach fast and get through it this morning. But in verse number 5, Paul makes this statement. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally or, or worldly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. I want you to understand that every person's gift that they've been given from the time they were saved is a new mind. You see, Paul said this, that worldly people think about worldly things and spiritual people think about spiritual things. And if you're a spirit-led person, your mind should dwell on spiritual things in your life. Many people come to me, preacher, I just don't feel like a Christian. I'm just suffering. I, I, I can't serve God. I'm failing in my life. And I want to say, if I was filling my mind with everything you're filling your mind with, I'd be failing too. Let me get down here so y'all can hear it. If you go out and if I lived off MTV and secular thought and internet and Facebook and Instagram and that's what I filled my mind with constantly, no wonder I would be failing because my mind would be full of things that are not going to help me in my life. If you want to be spiritual, fill up on spiritual thoughts in your mind. Yeah, now, I want you to get this. Some of you negative people in here, you negative, 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 dragging around, oh, God, God. You know why? Because you're looking at everything in the world like it's going to help you. Friend, it's not going to help you. You want life in your, life in your world. You want peace in your life. You know where you go for that? Think spiritually. Go to God. He can show you the contentment and the happiness that you'll see that you'll never see in the other places in your life. Man, many of us get this idea that, boy, things are bad. It's because it's where you're looking from. Brother Dusty's talking about the pastor in Mexico. And what the difference is, many of us, whether we have a bunch or have nothing, the difference in our lives is how we're thinking and what our spiritual perspective is on things. You see, God's given you a brand new mind. When he saved you, he gave you a spirit that wants to think about spiritual things. Now, some of you teenagers in here, you're only here because your parents drug you here. I understand. I feel your pain today. And it shows on your face. You sit over there like this. And some of you husbands, you ain't far from this either. Because your wife brought you down. I get it. But I want you to know that if you're saved by the grace of God, 
Whether you realize it or not, there's something deep down inside of you. It's called the Holy Spirit of God. And whether you realize it or not, it says things like, you know that preacher's right. You know, boy, that is true. I'm kind of glad I came, right? Some of the teenagers are still not shaking their head. They're not glad they came. I'm talking about the other people. You get that idea that I'm glad, I, because inside you there's a mind, whether you realize it or not, it likes spiritual stuff. When he's up there singing in Christ alone, some of you in here, y'all like this. But that Holy Spirit on the inside is going, oh, I like this song. It just hasn't come out yet. It'll get there. You know, there's a new mind in us. God, Paul says, you have a new mind. You mind earthly things, you're going to experience death. You mind heavenly things and think about spiritual things, you'll experience life and peace in your life. If you look through the world, if you look at the world through carnal eyes, through worldly eyes, you don't see anything to be happy about. But when you look through it through the spiritual eyes, there's some things that God wants to show you in your life that will change your attitude and in your life. But I want you to notice in verse 9, notice the second gift we have. you got a new mind. But in verse 9, Paul says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. I want you to understand this morning, and I want you to get this, that we have been given a new nature you see what happened before you got saved is you were a fleshly person you only had one thing to look forward to and that is death you're going to live and do all you can and then you're going to die but when a person is saved uh, the Bible says that God gifts us if you didn't understand my, my language my English gets bad he gifted us the Holy Spirit he placed the Holy Spirit inside of us and the Holy Spirit gave us a new nature Paul said it like this to the Corinthians. He said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new what? Two of you got that word. If, if, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. And here's what happens. When you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes in you, some things change in your life. You look different. You sound different. You talk different. Something's changed inside of you. Is everybody with me? everybody with me but here's what happens man you get saved and I'm just gonna tell you because I've been here I, I'm gonna be honest with you you get saved man you throw that old man down don't you and you kick him pow 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 what about that pal and you leave him right you walk off I'm gonna serve Jesus right but you forgot you didn't kill him you just beat him up he's like a ninja he will get up sneak up on you and jump right back on you and it won't be long you'll be like man kind of doing the same things I used to I'm kind of acting like the same person I used to be you know what you got to do you got to put that rascal in a headlock I mean you got to get him tied up pop 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 throw him back down kick him four or five times you know what happened start living for Jesus but you know what you're gonna have to do all your life you're gonna have to fight him you know when people what most people do though as they says Christians they quit fighting you know, I'm going to put this in language you can understand, I hope. The problem with me dieting, here's the problem with me dieting. Everybody with me? I know I need to get in shape. I know I need to eat right. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat right today, brother. I get up and I eat my two little eggs, my little bowl of tofu and dirt. And I eat that. And then at lunchtime, I get just some sprigs of barley with just, you know, with spray it down with something that smells like meat. And I eat that, right? I'm good, boy. I'm good. And then Dale Edwards says, here, you want a donut? <laughs> so I eat six of them. Here's a snack. Well, you know what happens at supper time? I said, well, heck, I done ate six donuts. Right? I go get my fried chicken, some mashed potatoes and gravy. Heck, just throw some bacon on it just for good measure, right? And then they say, you want pound cake after? Oh, yeah, give me a couple pieces of that. You got any ice cream go on that, right? And because I ate the donut, my whole diet just falls apart. You know what most Christians do? They mess up and they quit. Well, I don't eat the donut now. Might as well just fall into the world. I tripped and fell into sin. Don't stay there. I made a mistake. We all do. Get up. 
come on, throw the old man off. Let's go. I know he jumped back on you, throw him back off. He throws, jumps back on you, throw him back off. You make a mistake, get back up. Listen, understand this. The Christian life is a struggle, and you've got an old nature that's a part of you. Just beat him down every chance you get, because if you don't, he'll beat you down. He will. I've met a million Christians who used to serve God. Used to. Used to is a hard thing. Used to is something that people do. And friend, I want you to understand that we have been given a new nature and we must fight the old nature until we die and then we can be live for the Lord with no struggle again. But notice that not only that, verse 14, notice what it says. Verse 14, we realize that we have a new mind and we have a new nature. But notice this third thing that Paul says we have in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God of God notice this third thing we have a new identity when I got saved whether you realized it or not and whether anybody else realized it or not I went from being the son of Howard Burrell to being a child of God does that does that make sense what I mean now you can't see it and you say well you still look like your dad you still talk in some ways like your dad I can see that I understand that but on the inside of me it's not any more than I'm a physical child but I have become a spiritual child of God and he is my father well you know that's something special isn't it I mean I'm a child of God whatever you know it's just who I am you ever had anybody tell you, man, your kid really reminds me of you? Sometimes people tell me that about Andy. They say, boy, you know, Andy kind of acts, walks, and talks like you. That's in those moments when you wish you'd have done better raising them, right? You know, it's like, man, I wish I'd have done a little better if he acts like me, right? But, but you understand that we're the child of God. When people see us, what should they identify us as? A child of God. There's a town called Antioch, a little town called Antioch way over toward Greece this little town of Antioch's in your Bible something unique happened in that town you know there was people there that were following Jesus and they began to persecute them people didn't like them serving Jesus didn't like them preaching about Jesus didn't like them talking about Jesus didn't like them spreading the gospel of Jesus and the Bible says they persecuted them but the Bible makes this one statement in the book of Acts it says that the people of God were first called Christians in Antioch now we got a group of people that are living a certain life, how are we going to label them? Well, we're going to label them by who they act like. They act like Christ, we'll call them Christians. You see, being a Christian is not your position. If you're a child of God and saved, that's your position. You're not a Christian until you act like Christ. Is everybody with me? You got You with me? When, when, when somebody looks at Brother Dusty, they shouldn't say, hey, that looks like a, a child of a bracket. He looks like a bracket because of his dad. No, no, it shouldn't be that way. It should be, man, there's something different about that guy. There's just something about him. I think he's a Christian. Everybody with me? You, 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 no, you're not. It's okay. It's all right. A new identity known for different things. You see, my identity is not how I cut my hair or how I dress. Everybody understand that? Your identity is what you're all about. When people get around you, they go, this person's about Christ. This person's about Jesus. This person's about the gospel. Their identity is wrapped up in them. It's like, man, this person really is serious about this Jesus thing, aren't they? You know what that is? It's your identity, right? It's what you identify with. Everybody everybody ever met somebody who's a Star Trek fan? They're serious, ain't they? I mean, they're all about it, you know? And, and, and you know if they're a real Star Trek fan because if you say, do you like Star Wars? The answer is always no. I mean, it's like a bitterness there. You can't like both, just only one. And when you're around them, it doesn't take you long. They got a little term they call, they call them Trekkies. You know why? They're all about Star Trek. You know? We all got something like that in our life, but understand this, the thing we ought to be known for is Christ. Our identity should be contained in Jesus Christ. So much so that when people look at us, they go, man, I don't know what he is, but I know this, he's a Christian. I don't know where he's from, but I know this, 
They're a Christian. I don't know what she's all about, but I do one thing she's about. She's about Christ. It's an identity. Identifying with Jesus Christ. But I want to give you this third thing, and this won't be as popular, but it's okay. Y'all can take it. We looked at three ways not to live your life. We don't need a rule book. We don't need some kind of formula. We we don't need uh, some type of experience. We've got the spirit of Jesus Christ. Everybody with me? We've got the Holy Spirit inside of us. We don't need those three things. But we have three gifts that empower us to serve him. But I want you to get this. We've got one giant obligation in our life. And Paul addresses this obligation in verse number 12. Notice what he says in verse number 12. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. Now I want you to get this. You know what Paul's saying? We don't owe the flesh anything. I asked the early service this question. I hope y'all will answer this properly as well. If, if, if I said, what is it that you deserve? The one thing that you deserve, I hope your answer would be the same as the 9 o'clock service is what? Death. We deserve, and and I'm not being harsh here, we deserve a part in the lake of fire for eternity. Not because Matt Burrell sinned one time. Not because Matt Burrell sinned ten times today. But I've been sinning for 45 years. And if you piled my sin up in this room, nobody would ever come back to this church. You'd never want to be around me again if you could look at my sin. None of you would. Y'all would be, y'all would be, appalled by the person I am and so if you said Matt what do you deserve I deserve hell that's what I deserve I'm not even trying to make myself sound like a great guy oh you're a pastor you're this you're that yeah so are a thousand other people what's that really mean on the inside of us sin dwells in us it dwells in us Jesus Christ saved me by his amazing grace Here's what he did. He said, man, I know you can't pay for your sin. I'm going to die on the cross for you. I'll face death for you. I'll raise from the dead because you'll never raise from the dead if I don't. I'll pay that price. And he said this, and everyone who calls on me, I'll save them and they can become a child of God. That's what he did. So the question is, what do I owe my flesh? I don't owe it anything. I don't know it anything, yet I hear Christians say all the time, but preacher, I deserve this. I bought this new truck because I deserve it. No, you don't. Preacher, I did this because I deserve it. No, we, we, no you didn't. Our flesh does, it does, should, does not require anything from us because our flesh has never done anything for us. Our flesh is what tells us you don't need Jesus. Our flesh is what tells us, oh, Matt, you're strong, you're young, you're a young guy, you're going to live forever, it's going to be okay, you don't need none of this Jesus talk, you'll be fine. That's what the flesh says. The flesh says, Matt, you'll be fine on your own. The flesh says, Matt, you're not that bad of a guy, you're a good guy. That's what my flesh says. You see, my flesh is trying to take me away from God. The question is, what do I owe it? I don't owe it anything. I don't owe it one thing in my life. Not one thing do I owe it. And Paul answers this question. Notice what he says in verse 13. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you live through the Spirit to mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. You understand what he's saying? He's saying you don't owe the flesh anything because it's trying to take you to the grave. But the Holy Spirit that God's put in you, it deserves all your emphasis. It deserves all your care. It deserves all your thought because it's the thing that will take you on to be with Jesus Christ one day. Let me say it like this. I'm going to be done. I promise. The flesh does nothing for you. Matter of fact, the flesh is what causes the struggle I talked about. It's the thing I'm fighting with in this body that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. So how do I serve God? By the Spirit. You see, when I die and I get to heaven and and, and God says, man, these things were accomplished by Matt Burrell. Do you realize that Matt Burrell didn't accomplish any of those things? But that the Holy Spirit through me accomplished those things. You understand that the Holy Spirit is the way God can use you to serve him so here's the que- here's the answer to the question how do I serve God be led by the Spirit 
You see, there's the Spirit of God that lives in you. It tells you what you need to do and what you need to do. You, you don't have to call me up and get a list. Well, you call me up and say, Preacher, should I? You know what that tells me? The Holy Spirit's already revealed to you you probably shouldn't. Or you wouldn't be calling me. You see, when you go to work, you don't have to be told what's right and wrong. If you're a child of God, the Holy Spirit indwells you. You know what you should be talking about what you shouldn't be talking about. Here's what I'm asking you to do this morning. I'm asking you to mind the Spirit. Mind it. Be seeking for with it. Looking for what it's trying to tell you. Understanding through your reading of the Word of God what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you for how you should live. You, you understand that the flesh will fail you every time. If you think, what, Matt, what does Matt want? I promise I'm going to head in the wrong direction. But if I ask this question, what's the Holy Spirit want me to do? There's the right answer every time. There's the right answer every time. Because the Holy Spirit's going to challenge you in ways you've never even thought about. It's going to say, Matt, you should do that. I'm going to say, I don't need to do that. That's not what I would do. The Holy Spirit says, but that's what I would do. And at the end of your life, when you've accomplished things for God, you stand before him, and the things you've done for him won't be because of you, but because the Holy Spirit, he worked through you and achieved all these things. That's what the Holy Spirit does. I want you to be led, church. Led by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, I ask you to challenge every heart. God, I ask you to speak to every heart and challenge us to be led by your Spirit. Lord, we love you, and Lord, we're thankful to be in your house. But God, I ask you that we would drop the flesh and embrace the Spirit. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around. While I was preaching this message, I made the statement that the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. But I know and there's no doubt in my mind that in a church this size with this many people here, that somebody here is not a believer. That the Holy Spirit is not inside of you because you've never called out for salvation. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth, believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Salvation is not a feeling, but it is a believing in your heart and a confessing with your mouth what Jesus has done for you. And if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, I want you to know that I have sat right where you sit. Every person who is a believer, there was a time in their life when they were not a believer. I wonder if they're here and you'd be brave enough to say, Preacher, I'm that person. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed, no one's looking around. I wonder if you'd slip that hand up and say, Preacher, would you pray for me? I've never been a believer in Christ. I've never given my life to Christ. Slip it up and write back down. Is there another? Just slip it up and write down. Preacher, I'm, I'm not a believer. I'm not sure that I'm saved. See that hand. And I want you to know that salvation is as easy as right where you're at, calling on him and asking him to save you, telling him what you believe, that he lived and died to forgive your sins. And here in a moment, we're going to have a verse of invitation right where you're at. I'm going to ask you to ask Jesus to save you. But if you're here this morning and you're a believer, I'm going to ask you through this brief verse of invitation, right where you sit, to say, God, help me to put off the flesh and embrace the Spirit. As he sings one verse of invitation, 